You're so generous, we haven't even done anything yet. Uh, maybe we should stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you all for, for coming here. The link side amongst you will have noticed that I am not Jim Nochte. I am Jeff Baskerville, and this is Peter Sachs over here. Uh, very distinguished gentleman, a polymath, uh, artist, academic, poet, writer, and with a keen eye for the lyricism and the importance of the ballad and lyric poetry. Now, our theme was announced as Sir Walter Scott as a lyrical nationalist, but we're going to sort of pan wider than that, with your permission. Uh, Walter Scott, of course, was one of the great figures who put wind under the wings of one of the great European intellectual movements, uh, Romanticism. But he also did it from the standpoint of great familiarity with the intimacy of his own ground and the sound of his own language and spoken words around him. So, Peter, I would want to ask you to start yes. with, if you were to take history's camera yes. and just take a snapshot of Walter Scott and his ballad uh, area, what, yes. would, what would you have in the picture? Well, um, hello, everybody. <laughs> I would have in the picture a couple of things, one of which does, in fact, touch on the question of lyric nationalism, because I would want to say that, in my view, Scott is what I would call a lyric localist, but with international rather than strictly national reverberations. And where one begins with Scott is where he began, where falling in love with ballads, and I think this is crucial because how did he first encounter them? He encountered them by hearing them um, recited, not reading them, and by whom? By his grandmother, Barbara Scott. And this idea, and we're going to be talking about I'm going to be talking about border ballads, but also how ballads are about borders. And that's a border right there between generations, between men and women, the idea that the women are somehow the repositories of this ancestral knowledge which is handed on and therefore has not just a local flavor, but a familial, almost genealogical uh, inflection. So he heard them um, while here at Sandy no, and then he heard a piece recited also, and this is crucial, since that was a, a, a Scottish border ballad that he would have been hearing from his grandmother. But he also heard, and this comes to the question of nationalism too, one of the things I'm going to be saying is that ballads are very often hybridized um, forms that are made up of fusions of several cultures, which is why borders are so crucial to them. But an important moment for him was hearing a rec another recitation of a fragment of a translation of a German ballad by the great German balladist of the uh, late 18th century, Berger, and it's a famous ballad, Leonora. And that stirred his imagination to the point where he felt that indeed there was a potential prestige and a potential cachet, as well as an enormous emotional um, availability for him to go and systematically start intervening amongst ballads himself, collecting them, transcribing them, and indeed composing them. So I would introduce these ingredients of the grandmother's recitation, um, very local, very familial, and yet this almost from another border importation since ballads cross borders. And he himself studied German and translated the ballad himself. And that became his first publication in 1796. He publishes a translation of this ballad of a German. And it's, um, in a way, the beginning of his career, because it's only after that that he starts collecting border ballads and uh, what he calls the minstrelsy. Do we know what yeah. ballads were in circulation that his grandmother would have read to him? What was the, the milieu of the time? Well, the milieu is a fine question because it was very oral. And, in fact, many people were lamenting the moment in the 18th century where people started to transcribe these for the first time because they felt that they were taking them out of the living world of performance and recitation and face-to-face -face encounter and bringing it into the mediated world of print uh, and w where, where one's relation to the language on the page was very different to one's relation to having it um, recited or even, I should say, sung. So there were a few anthologies drifting around of ancient um, Scottish ballads, poems about the chronicles, about the battles, love songs, but the majority of what he was encountering here in these very trees, in these very forests, often if you read his notes, he says, 
I, I learned this poem by listening to it from the shepherd who works on the estate of so-and-so next door. So there's a tremendous almost rhizome-like root system that was permeating the region both imaginatively and in terms of these people's experience. And remember, this is an era without radio, without television, without too much circulated, many people illiterate. So the ballad took on a very, very concentrated power, which is very difficult for us to a match nowadays with all our different media. It was a very, very concentrated medium. And I want to stay with that word medium because for me it relates with mediation. And mediation for me, not just in terms of the work that gets done around here, but is crucial particularly around borders. And that's not just a geographical borders, but often borders between sects or between religious beliefs or between um, his historical peoples. So I want to keep alive the idea of the ballad as a medium the way painting is a medium or an art is a medium, but also how ballads can mediate just in the way that his translation of the German ballad mediates between German culture and Scottish culture at that time. A very important formation of Romanticism by that means of crossing borders and going beyond borders by means of the ballad. It's the ballad that crosses the border. I think this is a good time to hear one. Could you uh, please yes, by read all us means. the ballad, see what we're talking about, what we're listening to? Yes. Now, um, many of the ballads are of various genres, as I was saying. Some are strictly about battles, and the borders in that case were not just the borderlands between the North and the Scottish Kingdom on, on the one hand, and the South and the um, British English uh, on the other. But very often those borders were very closely drawn between clans, between feuding, rivals, um, with their own historical um, memories of you stole this from me or you abducted my sister and all of these sorts of uh, quarrels that are being, being recorded in ba ballads as if ballads were the record book in the psyche. And we can get to neuroscience at some point, but I have a very strong feeling that ballads played an important role in reaching those parts of the brain and of the psyche that retain memory in ways that are very different from the mere cognitive cerebral cortex. So there's an important way in which ballads are not just crossing national or interpersonal borders, but they are, and if there's nothing else I managed to get across to you today, they are also crossing borders within the brain, within the mind. They are crossing borders between our reason and our emotion, between our fears and our desires. And the art form, the mediating art form, is able to reconcile and ideally integrate these otherwise warring parts of ourselves. And so this is absolutely crucial. And I'll start by um, reciting a ballad that is somewhat historical, takes you back to the 13th century, since many of these ballads arose in the 13th, 14th centuries and were never written down until the 17th century. So the following ballad that I'm about to recite exists in more than eight versions, more than nine versions. And that too is crucial because ballads themselves have fungible borders. There's this version of the ballad, there's another border, the, the border of the ballad then widens or shortens as somebody adds something, subtracts something. So they are very labile and that too is important. But the very first ballad that is collected in Sir Walter Scott's um, groundbreaking anthology, because in 1802, remember he was born in 1771. In fact, his birthday was day before yesterday. So he was born in 1771, and he, in 1802, began systematically collecting, partly because he felt that this was dying out, that almost like the trees that are threatened, the ballad culture was threatened by the oncoming of modernity and print culture and so on. So he started recording and anthologizing. And the very first poem that he puts in his, what became four volume, Minstrelsy of the Scottish Border, is the very famous ballad of Sir Patrick Spence. And I'm sure many of you know that. In fact, I could just ask for a raise of hands if anybody does, because I'm curious to know how defunct uh, this whole ballad um, business is. All right, good. So there's nobody in the room, or, um, or maybe one or two, who has a, a dim recollection. All right, right, good. A few modest, modest people in the back. But um, the ballad of Sir Patrick Spence, before I recite it, I want to say something else mm. about the ballad, which is also to do with Beyond Borders. It does cross not just parts of the psyche, but it crosses between the mind and the body. And the word ballad, as you can imagine, is etymologically related to the word ballet. Why? Because not only did people sing 
ballads, they danced to them. And the relation of engaging the whole body with its enormous somatic potential for emotion and below cognition is something that was recruited and enlisted as one danced to the words and they became part of your rhythmic identity. You did things together. There was an eros to it. And those components are very important when we think of the ballet is to take them off the print of the page and bring them into a living embodied experience, something like dance. Now, I'm not about to dance the ballad of Sir Patrick Spence, but I am wanting to remind you that it should be a physical experience and that the rhythm of the, ba uh, of the ballad and the ballad form because when I said it's a medium, its medium depends very much on its aesthetic form, which has to do with repetition, with a certain identity of the line lengths, with rhyme, all of these features which make it mnemonically powerful, but also create a stirring effect. And I will recite the ballads to Patrick Spence. Then at some point, remind me, because I'm just going to free associate here, uh, I want to say something about my own exposure to Scottish ballads and border ballads and show you what a weird hybrid fusion of misapprehension that might involve. I think lots of ballads are about <clears throat> not just apprehending, stealing cattle, stealing women, but they're very often about making big mistakes. We heard about a big mistake, I think, uh, from William uh, Dalrymple just a moment ago, a, a, a severe misapprehension. Anyway, the ballad of Sir Patrick Spence begins, it's called Sir Patrick Spence, but the first person mentioned in the poem is the king. So you immediately want to ask yourself, what's the relation between the king and the hero of the ballad Sir Patrick Spence, which starts, I would say, drawing you to meditate on questions of power and of hierarchy. Because another feature of the ballad is that it's not just about moving beyond borders, but very often it's about power reversals. Those who seem to be in power at the beginning of the ballad are very often the ones who are disempowered at the end of the ballad. And that disempowerment it could be material, possessions, things are stolen from them, or somebody dies, it's death. Or it might even be a moral um, uh, subversion, where the person who seems to be at the top at the beginning of the poem at the end is in a moral position which we learn to judge as having been suspect. And so the Ballad of Sir Patrick Spence begins, it presumably goes back to an event in the 13th century. King Alexander III of Scotland decides that he's got to send a ship out uh, to sea. And a uh, big mistake, but what are the consequences? So. I'll just get up, at least that's a little more than sitting. <laughs> and, um, and, and I think in dancing, the back and forth of the dance corresponds to the back and forth of the ballad form in its stanzas, remember? Um, remember, stanza is the Italian word for a room. And the shape of the, of, the, of the stanza dictates what goes on in the shape of the room. So um, Walter Scott said that the borders were a stage for certain kinds of experience and certain kinds of events and certain kinds of awareness. So let's think that I'm on the border of various kinds of um, domains here between you and me, between the printed page and the spoken word. And the king sits in Dumferling Town, which is a place where the kings in the 13th century spent a lot of time. All right? The king sits in Dumferling Town, drinking the blood red wine. Oh, where will I get a good sailor to sail this ship of mine? Up and spoke an elden knight, sat at the king's right knee. Sir Patrick Spence is the best sailor to sail upon the sea. The king has written a broad letter and signed it with his hand and sent it to Sir Patrick Spence was walking on the sand. The first line that Sir Patrick led, read, a loud laugh laughed he. The next line, Sir Patrick read, the tear blinded his een. Oh, who is this has done this deed, this ill deed done to me, to send me out this time of the year to sail upon the sea? Make haste, make haste, my merry men all, our good ship sails the morn. Oh, say no so, my master dear, for I fear a deadly storm. Late, late, yes, dream. I saw the new moon with the old moon in her arm, and I fear, I fear, my dear master, that we shall come to harm. Oh, our Scots nobles were right loath to wet their cork-heeled shoon. 
But long before the play were played, their hats they swam a boon. Oh, lang, lang, may their ladies sit with their fans into their hand, or ere they see Sir Patrick Spens come sailing to the land. Oh, lang, lang, may the ladies stand with their gold combs in their hair, waiting for their ain dear lords, for they'll see them no mair. Half o'er, half o'er, to Abadur, tis fifty fathom deep, and there lies good Sir Patrick Spens with the Scots lords at his feet. So that is the... Um, <clears throat> well, that's... <laughs> but realize that what we are applauding is an anonymous composer of a poem that gets circulated, handed down. We don't know who wrote the Ballad of Sir Patrick Spence. Uh, no way to know it. It wasn't written down for centuries. And yet it stuck in the folk memory and not in the memory of the court. Because as I'm hoping you've got a sense, there was an, a potential critique of this king who sits in Dumfurling Town. He's drinking the blood red wine. Yes, that was a formula, right? wine as red as blood. But there is something perhaps parasitical or vampiric about this man who drinks the wine of his possessions and who wants to know who will, who's the best sailor. He doesn't even know his own people. And to sail the ship of mine as if he owns everything. And remember that when Sir Patrick spends, he says, make haste, make haste, uh, merry men, all our good ship. So these are two models of ownership. The crew as a community owns a ship in a certain way. It's almost like Marx's labor theory of value. But the king, his claim to ownership of that is marred also by his ignorance of uh, what the conditions might be, what the consequences might be, and so on. So he um, sits there and writes this letter. Now I want to just say one thing about the difference between oral and written culture because the ballad was an oral form and I think there was a deep-seated suspicion of written culture um, by the folk, some of them who couldn't read. Why? Because a letter could be sent. I could send a letter to somebody else to say, um, you are hereby uh, commanded to advance into Afghanistan or into Iraq and do X, Y, and Z. And you do not have a face-to-face uh, relation to that person. You do not take ethical responsibility. Why? Because it's mediated by this command. And what is that whole phenomenon of mediating a command, making it impersonal, and not having a one-to-one -one relation with the person to whom you are uh, commanding something? Now notice how in the poem there is an opportunity to oppose that mediated writing of a letter with a face-to-face -face encounter which is marked by the word dear. Because the minute um, that Sir Patrick says, we've got to go, one of his uh, crew members says, oh, say not so, my master dear. So he's, in a, he's speaking to him. There's dialogue, there's conversation. And at that moment, I want to stress something else, which is that given the question of borders, what are the borders of the kingdom? Sir Patrick is walking on the border of the kingdom. He's walking on the sand when he gets the letter. The king is about to send a ship beyond his own borders and into an element that he cannot control. Earlier today, we were hearing about global warming and climate change and the question of what does that do to borders when your sense of the borders is indeed the border of the globe and we're all stuck within this globe and what's coming at us transcends issues of am I in Scotland or am I in Albania. So um, the, 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 the address of the crewman who, remember, is the lowest person in the poem. You've got the king, you've got Sir Patrick Spence. Why is it that the folk wisdom associated with the moon and with the tides and the conditions of the elements, the world itself, let's say, beyond politics, why is it that that knowledge should come from the lowliest person uh, in the poem. And that, I think, is also the most poetic moment of the poem where he says, late, late, yestreen, I saw the new moon with the old moon in her arms. And you've all seen that beautiful moment that in sailor lore heralded a potential storm where the new moon is holding. So inevitability of change. But this beautiful attunement to the vertical axis as opposed to the horizontal axis of political control, that takes the poem to a different dimension. And it's coming from that low person. Now, Walter Scott knew uh, and felt all of this, and I think that there's a reason why that poem uh, stands at the very beginning of what then becomes a mini-volumed collection of ballads, as if to set the store. And this is a kind of border ballad, the borders of human control. However good the ship, 
that however good human technology, you can't win over the elements of a storm, right? A king's, the limits of a king's control. Now, my feeling is that in Beyond Borders, often what's going on is, uh, in terms of conflicts, is that the conflicting parties have an over uh, exaggerated notion of what their own powers are and they don't have an adequate sense of what the overarching limits to their power might be and so they operate as if they have complete power I, it's either me or you and they don't realize that there's something else that might threaten them both and these are issues that I think are embedded in border ballads because ballads are fascinated by those kinds of borders not just geographical but the limits of political power, the limits between the human and the natural world, and very often psychological borders. Well, all of this very yeah. simply seems to put uh, a ring around almost like a Jungian concept of the elements that you just teased out yes. in those poems, which do bring in this question of the overarching thing which nobody is looking at. Yes. I think ballads are fascinated by what nobody is looking at. And in that regard, too, they're often about what is repressed, not just what is about uh, what is neglected. And by repression now, I mean, also can, can include sexual repression. I can um, include the repression of daughters by their fathers, um, of certain powers over um, other people in possession of a few flocks that they can then seize at any moment. Is might right? Ballads are asking these questions all the way through. Who is being repressed? And often, how much of that repression is internal? So, yes, I, I, I think that's very much the case. And there's many other ballads I could be um, presenting to you, but I also want to have this be a dialogic, um, conversational moment. So I want to, though, uh, just put myself here as what I would call an embodiment of somebody who feels themselves to be composed of something that's very much beyond borders. Because I'm interested in impurity. I'm interested in what we might call anti-fundamentalism anti when it comes to a fundamental notion of what our identities are. Because often the people who think that they are most clearly identified one way are misapprehending the nature of what constitutes that identity. Because often it's not what they think it is. Now, I want to say that there is such a thing, and this is just talking completely off the top of my head, no evidence, but what I would call, metaphorically, imaginative DNA, right? The DNA of your imagination. And I think that the DNA of our imaginations is potentially as strong, in many ways, as the DNA of our own genetic backgrounds, or even of our obvious given circumstances where we grew up and so on. Now, who am I? Um, I'm here to talk about poetry, but I'm actually a painter, and I'm interested in the borders between poetry and painting, and even within paintings, and these are large paintings about the size of that whole um, banner there, or bigger, and they use many media. They cross between language and, they, and paint. They cross between cloth and other kinds of elements, cardboard and so on, and they are trying to integrate by layering, and that's another topic. I think ballads are fascinated by layers. And the point of the ballad is to excavate the layers within a society, within the psyche. And um, not only am I here as a fusion on the border between painting and poetry, but primarily painting now, but I am a, a person whose imagination was first stirred by Scottish ballads and border ballads. And where was this? This was in Durban, South Africa. All right, so the migratory power of these ballads are enormously strong. Now, how did this happen? I thought, because my mother's family name was Gordon, that I was somehow a Gordon. Now, as you know, the Gordons are a very entrenched family from this very region, and they show up in many of Scott's ballads, the, the gay Gordons or the uh, gallant Gordons. And uh, so I thought, oh, I must be one of those gallant Scottish Gordons. And um, identified very strongly with the sort of glamour and the heroism and the strange elegiac uh, gloriousness of the Scottish, particularly as it was being embodied by people in exile or expatriate Scottish in South Africa. In other words, how were they holding on to their identity by thinking of Scottish music, Scottish rituals, uh, Scottish ballads? Now, I realized also, somehow, perhaps later, because I do feel that there are layers in the self, that was a very strong formative notion of my identity. I was this heroic, young, Scottish border um, fellow who was perhaps 
not recognized for his legitimacy or he was going to do something heroic and save somebody or elope with some fantastic woman and conquer and have a castle and then defend it and all of these fantasies that go into a child but they form one's adult life. If you're going to take risks later in life, what is your tendency to risk taking as it's been formed in your early life? Are you imaginatively open to saying, I can be a hero, I can uh, abide by a code of honor? Where do those things come from? And I would say that the more various the places from which those things come, the better. That, that should not come from some transcendent religious dogma, let's say, which you, you must behave like this because this is written. No, there's a much more imaginative way of engaging what you are and what you could be. However, my misapprehension, thinking that I was a Gordon and a Scottish and so on, and I used to canter on my, uh, like this, you know, around, around the hills and around the, the beaches of South Africa, thinking I was about, and picking up a piece of wood and swords and all of this stuff, um, about to slay the others, and um, something aggressive, yes, um, potentially something defensive, but these are how one's body and one's mind gets formed. I was the son of... A mother and a father who were both born in South Africa, who were their parents? All four of them were Lithuanian Jews. <laughs> All right. So here you have this Lithuanian Jewish South African galloping around the wilds of Africa, thinking that he's somehow a Gordon uh, Scottish border hero. And what is that confused identity? And this was very vivid because things were um, palpable in the, in, in, in the Durban of the 1960s. This is the era of apartheid. Um, people were coming into the city of Durban, which as you know is primarily Zulu. People were wearing tribal gear. Women were topless, just coming in in a few beads, uh, the Zulu women. There was a huge Indian population, both Muslim and Hindu. There were, you could hear the call to prayer in the mosques. You could see people going into the Hindu temples. And down the road, below our house, and by the way, our house was near the corner of Gordon Road and Musgrave Road. And this is all because there were a lot of Scottish who came down to Durban in the 1820s. Um, down the road was a tennis court where I would go and play tennis on Sunday afternoons in my very proper whites. But in that park where the tennis um, was being played, there was a Scottish marching band. And they would every, there was a Caledonian Society of Durban. And they were in full regalia with their kilts and their sporns and their fabulous bagpipes and their wonderful drums and their marching gear, marching up and down in the park, uh, semi-jungle park, uh, as if they were in Scotland. And they were capturing my imagination completely because they were moving in rhythm, they were heroic, the music was stirring. And I thought, yes, this is much more persuasive for me than the, than the Hindu or the, or the Muslim call to prayer or indeed my grandfather who would be visiting us and was upstairs in the house in a suit with a prayer shawl making his Jewish prayers. So this major confusion or conflation um, was anchored though by my absolute captivity. I was taken possession of by these ballads and hence I have this particular affiliation uh, with, this, with this form. And so I wanted to bring that forward as an embodiment of how ballads can play a role in mediating what would be otherwise incompatible um, identities. Now, um, two days before I came here from uh, the United States, I met somebody who's been doing reconnaissance work as an anthropologist in Afghanistan. And he has been speaking to Pashtun tribes. And he has been obviously realizing the degree to which it's very difficult to get through a lot of cultural barriers and a lot of distrust. And one of the um, instruments of mediation that he has found absolutely crucial is he comes into these Pashtun tribes, these rural communities, and he plays recordings of ballads that go back to the Pashtun culture. There was a great Pashtun poet called Rahman Baba who collected old oral poetry going back to Pashtun. And there was somehow a kind of channel opened up by means of this art uh, that allowed them to cluster about the phenomenon of the ballad and make progress in having a conversation rather than just talking across an ideological divide. And this strange um, adaptability of the ballad, incidentally, I think it's the case, somebody can correct me, that when a soldier, a British soldier dies in Afghanistan, 
um, there is a part of the ceremony of the funeral, they play a particular pipe um, piece of music that goes back to the Scottish border ballad of the Battle of Flodden. And um, that was the music that was associated with the 16th century Scottish uh, lament is still now being used to mark the death of a soldier in Afghanistan. So this question of these ways in which ballads travel across borders, I know I'm drifting, but, um, and I could certainly speak on other ballads. There's fantastic ones, the Douglas tragedy, which is set very much around here of, a, of, of an attempted erotic elopement, which goes very wrong and um, uh, ends up with a, a, just a horrible scene. I might read it just to end, but um, in a moment, uh, and a few others. I want to stress, though, that there is another border that needs to be introduced here for ballads, and that is the border of life and death, because many ballads are obsessed uh, not just with the question of possession, who owns what, but the question of the ultimate dispossession, which is being robbed of life. And how do you mediate that chasm? Uh, how do you negotiate with that particular enemy? How do you talk with death? Well, I think ballads are one of the ways in which one talks with death. And indeed, many ballads have the dead speaking to the living. And there's a crucial message that the dead have to give the living in many instances, which governs the living's attitude towards mourning. And one of the famous ballads that Sir, Patrick, uh, that Sir Walter Scott gathered uh, is a ballad called The Unquiet Grave. I might just read that very quickly, and, uh, because it's very short, it's much shorter than, um, than Sir Patrick Spence, but at least it will uh, introduce you to this other feature of the ballad, which has to do with crossing the border between the living and the dead. Um, so give me half a sec, and I'll read you The Unquiet Grave, um, which I think also is set um, very near here. Let me see. If I don't have it, it's not the end of the world, um, because we're told by the ballad that one should not get stuck or fixated on what one has lost. <laughs> one, has to, one has to move on. And, and that's, too, I think, a very important, but I'm, I'm just glad if you get the, um, the sense that ballads do speak across that border as well. I'll let it go for the moment. I've got others. What we um, should probably yes. do is cross the border because between the stage the and the auditorium and, yeah. and ask for some input from, from the far side. Can we um, ask some questions, please? Yes. This lady here. Yes. I'm oh, really interested in uh, what you were saying about they used to dance to the ballads. I wasn't aware of that. Um, yes. I've lived in Canada for seven years, ah. and I went to the uh, Scottish Patriots Club. Oh, yeah. And, you know, here in Scotland, uh, if there's Scottish music or Scottish dance, we hook and we hook and we yes. do all sorts of things, you know, we get into it. Yes. And, <laughs> and I made the mistake of doing that at this club and they all turned and looked at me as though I was totally drunk and out of my mind. And I suddenly realised that somehow the hooking and the hooking hadn't gone along with the singing and the dancing. And it was, it was just interesting. And hadn't made the journey across the Atlantic, which it should have, hadn't gone across the border, which it should have done. Yeah, it because it, it initially but it hadn't carried on. Yeah, but it's an yeah. absolute amputation to sever the corporeal embodiment of this language by cutting off the ballad from the sung version and the instrumental music, which of course taps re down into the pre-verbal parts of us, um, but then also the engaging of the body. And as I said before, ballad related to the word ballet it is absolutely crucial that they would dance and sing. And that's not exclusive to the Scottish, by the way. That goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks. You know, the ancient Greek odes were sung and danced. That's why we call them strophes and antistrophes. They would sing in one direction, and then they would turn, and they would sing in the next. And there would be a turn in the poem, and an argument in the top poem. And then they would come back, and they'd do an antistrophe again, which would try to synthesize those two warring movements. It's fascinating, the relation of dance and poetry. And my feeling is that we've lost a lot of that, even in the kind of poetry that's getting composed now, is that it's poetry that's not composed adequately to appeal to the entire body or, or, the, or the entire more than cerebral parts of the mind. It's rather like the elephants, which we heard earlier this morning. There were six million, there's now maybe 600,000. Elephants, of course, being the great repositories of memory. And we, we're losing, we're, we're, we're losing so much.
And um, if, if, if there's anything that I can have done today, which is to just bring a flavor of these ballads and what kind of cultural work they were able to do, uh, I'd be grateful and have you go and read them, but read them as if they were coming off the page with a lot of vivacity. Other questions? There's a lady here that would... Yeah. Uh, thanks. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, Dorothy and I were both remembering that we did learn Sir Patrick Spence at school. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and my question is, do you, there's a lot of debate just now about whether um, children should learn to recite poetry in schools. Yes. Um, I'm interested in your views. Oh. I have a view on that, which <laughs> is, like if I could take one got, nail out of this floorboard and put it up against Mount Everest, my feeling is Mount Everest is that they should recite, they should learn to memorize, they should take it into themselves, and they have to have them as they're walking around, as they're in the world. Poetry does not exist on the page, it does not exist in the library, it exists in the world, particularly the border ballads, which are about the weather. Uh, the Unquiet Grave begins with a, with, a, with a reference to that there's a slight wind and a few drops of rain. And it's attentive to the elements, just as it's attentive to the moon, it's attentive to the trees and what the trees have to say. And so they need to have these things in themselves and it also then becomes part of their identity. Um, you can take away their book, but you can't take away what's inside them. And that's an absolutely important part of their identity. So I am completely, uh, if we can say completely to the power of 90, um, persuaded that they absolutely should memorize, they should recite. I have my students do that all the time and they say, and then I say, and tell me now what's your difference, what's the difference in your relation to the poem once you've memorized it? And it's astonishing. Astonishing. There's a yeah. lady in the middle there. Yes. Um, I'm totally overwhelmed by your talk. I do poetry performance, and ah. um, I I learned poetry with my grandparents. And there we are. Um, when I promote them, I, I do it mostly in Spanish, but I I say it's reviving this extinct yes. um, good tradition. But yes. why do you think uh, it has gone extinct when theater is still so well celebrated? I think it's gone extinct for many reasons. I think print culture has dominated oral culture. I think it's easier to commodify a ballad if you can sell it than when you can recite it uh, in the way in which it was recited for many, many centuries. And I, I think there's many other reasons for it. But I'm fascinated to hear about your learning from your grandparents the way Scott learned from his grandmother. And in fact, I was speaking with Urkos um, from the Basque country, and he was saying that there was a crucial role of the ballad at the time of trying to revive a sense of the Basque identity and how important ballads were and how subversive they can be, just as they were during the Spanish Civil War. I mean, Lorca, a great uh, anti-Franco um, uh, figure, was somebody who understood the ballads deeply and knew them all by heart and wrote them. And ballads can be potentially, politically, very, very subversive. Sir Patrick Spence is a rather oblique one, but there's some that are direct protests, and they're in the form. And I grew up in, growing up in South Africa, Zulu songs and the trade union songs of the Koza people were very much drew upon something like a ballad tradition. And um, this, is, this is true all the way to uh, the Bedouin tribes who are now marginalized in the Sinai. Uh, I was speaking to Reem about Palestinian uh, poetry and identity and how important that is. So this is a huge subject, the question of ballads and performed and sung poetry. Thank you for the Do question. Do we have time yes. for one more question or are we... Yes, what? Yes, Carla. Did you just... Well, we might have to make two because oh, Urkos okay. is two, right two, at the two back. Microphones. I was just mentioning Urkos yeah. and then Oscar... I'm yeah. interested in in looking if you have searched about the capacity of the ballads to cross the borders yes. from far away in centuries, because it seems to me that a lot of the themes that are, been, are in the Scottish ballads are also very similar to the Basque ones. Yes. And at West Stange, ballads cross borders of course. a long time ago yes. and are very similar in different places. Yes, that's what I meant about a Scott getting fired up by listening to a German ballad. And many of these ballads go back to early Gaelic, early Welsh, early Irish, um, and 
I think Jung is right to come back mm. to uh, what Jeff was saying, that there are certain paradigmatic archetypes that are shared uh, by our brains and our, and our sense of what primitive culture is. And ballads are like embryos of entire cultural societies. And yes, they are shared and they do cross borders and they do have an enormous amount in common, just as myths. Uh, mythology. Claude Lévi-Strauss, of course, as an anthropologist, uh, spoke about what the uh, connections were between myths of all people, whether they're in Brazil or whether they're in, in Africa. Um, I, I, and then, of course, Carla. Uh, uh, th thanks very much, Peter. I yeah. remember reading your, your poetry. And, uh, I have been in your, the New York and would like this to publish. Uh, is it working? No. Yes. Okay, I can just... Start yeah. again. I remember reading your poetry uh, when you used to when published. I used to write poems, yes. I had been told that you were an amazing speaker. I didn't know you were also an amazing dancer. You, you oh, said no. that you just danced. Well, I didn't get very into the fling, but I... So, <laughs> thanks very much for that. The question, yeah. you yes. already began to answer it, I think. We have been told this morning that, uh, you know, politics is... We're, we're losing politics. Yes. The capacity to come yes. together, to gather, and perhaps yes. protest and... Uh, make things better. Do you think there is a connection between the uh, uh, near extinction of poetry as it is recited and sung and so forth and so forth, and uh, the you know the fact that we're losing politics? I think there is a deep relation, and I should um, immediately correct the misapprehension. There are forms of very very strongly performed poetry, rap poetry after all, and uh, poetry slams, and there's a lot of that. But um, this kind of poetry, which I think has a greater depth and a greater resonance, I do think that there is a relation between the over-mediatized superficiality in which a lot of politics is presented to us on the one hand and the loss of this deeper cultural understanding of what it is to have an integrated mind-body responsiveness uh, that transcends narrow borders. Yeah, yeah. Okay, final question. Firstly, a big hand. That was wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you, sir. Thank, thank you. Yeah. You know, I come from India. Yes. And everyone's been telling me that poetry is extinct. It's so strange that in India, we live for poetry, but it all revolves around romance. Yes. You know, little children, as you know, Bollywood, we're yes. singing songs of yes. love and romance all the time. Yes. We even sing and dance to the news. So when a child is born, there's a poetry. When the child goes to school, we uh, yes. write something and we sing and dance about it. Yes. And in India, it's all about searching for Sufiana Kalams. It could be Bulisha, it could be Jalaluddin yes. Rumi. Yes. Or we all write poetry in love. He, he's a barrister. He writes poetry for me too oh, yeah. now. <laughs> so but they see that's perfect. Literature that, and the law. Walter and Scott was a lawyer, obviously, and lovely. a poet. And, yeah. and so for me, my, my father is a, is a musician and I sing. And it's all about singing songs from the 13th and 14th century. And thank you so much. Yeah. You've inspired us further. But it's so wonderful for me because I would always feel, oh my God, India, are we really into art and culture? And coming here and seeing that... People are forgetting about poetry, but in India, it's we are living for poetry, love, and romance. Well, we need to learn from no. you. Yeah, thank you. I, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think it's, I think it's great that we've been able to cross so many borders culturally, politically, intellectually, imaginatively. I love the idea of your DNA of imagination. I, I think if we could clone strong. you and yes. sort of send you out to encourage sort of broader breadth of, of, of Oh, DNA yeah, we could have many, many Lithuanian, like South African, it. Jewish, Gordon <laughs> fantasists out there doing all kinds of uh, negotiations, I'm sure. But if anybody wants to hear more, I promise to be under the yew trees at 3.30 in the morning, and I'll recite to you many more ballads. All right, thanks.